Many of us know the poem, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Not only Columbus, but countless galleons in the quest for gold. Merchant ships sailing with empty holds fetching another form of gold, the Caribbean sugar. And slave ships of the infamous slave trade importing the labor to harvest that sugar. Now, the many 5.8 5.8 sailors in the transatlantic, the transat, race that began on January 11, 2025, are literally sailing over the same ocean bottom as they did. But what exactly is that route across the Atlantic? Why did Columbus and the 5.8 sailors go at least several hundred miles south of the Canary Islands prefer first going to the Caribbean? Why not just go straight across from Portugal or Spain? Isn't that shorter? Why is the Mini 5.8 Transat going east across the Atlantic when most circumnavigation races like the Vendee Globe go south to the Horn of Africa first? Why did the Mini 5.8s leave the Canary Islands in January? Why not the summer when it would be warmer? Or November when the Vendee Globe race started? But there are lots of good reasons that you'll see. Hi, this is Captain Tom again. I'm a United States Coast Guard MMC, that's a Master Mariner Captain. I've been a skipper of sailing boats from dinghies up to around 70 feet and sailed in almost every ocean. I've been a boat owner, charter master, bare boat charter qualifier, a sailing instructor, and have assisted in hundreds of sailors in Embryo achieve their dreams. Today we're going to talk about the whys, whens, and wherefores of the general route that Columbus took in his four voyages from a mariner's perspective, and how the 5.8 mini-class will retrace that route in the transat that began on January 2025. They are en route on this voyage as I make this video. So let's get started. But first, if you like this content, please punch on that subscribe and like button and set the notification bell so you get all of the future content that I'll put out about this epic and unprecedented circumnavigation, as well as the many others on the topic of sailing, voyaging, and yacht racing. For free. Got it punched? Let's go. To understand this route from a mariner's perspective, it is first important to know about ocean currents and prevailing winds. So let's talk about ocean currents first. When we stand on the shore and throw pebbles into the surf, we don't really see what's going on with the movement of water as a whole. We just see the waves crash on shore, recede, and crash on shore again. The fact is, however, is that the oceans the world over are in sort of a series of invisible rivers. In this depiction from NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, a service of the U.S. government view, you'll see these currents over the whole Earth. You yourself have access to this too at the link indicated. 
This is real-time data collected by sensors and satellite images from all over the world and rendered by a supercomputer. So one current that most of us are familiar with is the Gulf Stream, which is a river of ocean that moves from the east coast of Mexico all the way up to near Iceland. There are many others, and a couple in particular, that affected the Columbus route that we'll point out. Sailing ships of the pre-mechanized propulsion era, as well as the 5.8 meter class boats, typically have an average speed of around 5 knots. These ocean currents, however, at places can be even equal or greater than that. Therefore, if a ship of that era, or 5.8, is going up against an ocean current, not only will they take much longer to get there, but they have some risk of not even getting where they intend to at all. So these types of boats should always want to plan their route where the current helps them, never against them. Or you end up not planning as Columbus did, not, and just end up in a destination by speculation. After all, Columbus did not have Noah or the web. In this same NOAA depiction, there are two currents that affected Columbus's route. That is the Canary Islands and the North Equatorial Currents. You'll see that the Canary Current is a little weaker, but the North Equatorial Current is quite a bit stronger, and in fact is one of the strongest ocean currents on Earth. Both flow in an eastwardly direction. If you look at the depiction, you'll see how Columbus or anyone leaving southern Portugal or Spain would have a river that helps him to get where we know Columbus ended up in the New World. That is, the island chain of the Caribbean. If they go south enough first. This is why the 5.8 class left the Canary Islands rather than trying to go directly across from Spain or Portugal. Now, do modern ships observe these currents? Oh, absolutely. They want to get where they need to go with as little fuel as possible. Say that there is a 5 knot, and that's relatively common, current, and a modern ship that's going 18 knots, that's a typical speed, against that current. That's about a 25% increase in the amount of fuel needed, or a 25% reduction in speed. Try to sell that increase to the investors of the vessel. You'll see that if you go too far south, south of the e equator, or too far north, you'll get currents flowing in the other direction to the west. Also notice that all of the swirlies are reverse currents that are in places. A few of these swirlies even look stronger than any sailing ship could reliably power out of. Remember that these are invisible rivers with no physical river bank like a river we see inland. They're also not really fixed in place. They can change with the seasons. I wonder how many mariners were lost until their supplies ran out, or caught in a current that took them away from their destination, and dropped them in some icy deserted shore. We'll never know, but I'm sure it was more than a few. So let's move on to the other critical factor here. The wind. Like the ocean currents, the worldwide winds also have rivers where certain directions prevail in certain places. This prevailing wind tends to also change with the seasons. It's not absolute in strength and doesn't have fixed edges, the same as the currents. We can't see them. Local weather and land masses can disrupt this prevailing direction as well. In the depiction from NOAA that you see here, you'll see the winds as some are prevailing and flow in a fairly consistent direction as well as the swirls caused by storms and high pressure centers. Overall, and especially over the ocean, however, you can pretty much count on the prevailing winds a good share of the time. The sailing ships of Columbus's era were really designed to go with the prevailing winds and counted on that. Now the 5.8 is a much newer design, however, that does a pretty good job of sailing against the wind. But it's not only the winds themselves that have to be considered, it's also the size of the seas or the waves that accompany it. The more wind there is, the larger the seas, of course, and the more difficult they are to sail against. Good to avoid this as much as possible, especially on a 19-foot or 5.8-meter boat. So next, why go east first? 
Most circumnavigation races, like the Vendee Globe, Global Solo Challenge Race, or even the Tea Clipper Race of 1866, would go from the south from Europe first and head to the Cape of Good Hope at the tip of Africa. The reason why the 5.8 class doesn't do that? One word. The Panama Canal. Unlike these other circumnavigators, the 5.8 meter mini globe race is transiting the Panama Canal as well as passing through Indonesian waters rather than going into the Southern Ocean. Well, okay, two additional words for reason. Cape Horn or the Southern Ocean. Take your pick. They are doing it to avoid this. Now, the other thing that you don't see in this depiction is the cold of the Southern Ocean. The cold saps your strength like a shorted battery. This I know firsthand. Now, the other reason that they're going through the Panama Canal is to catch this trade wind. If you look at the lower left, you'll see Hawaii, and in the upper right, Mexico. And the ancient Polynesians knew this route well, and these trade winds were so predictable, these amazing mariners would be able to eyeball their navigation and find islands the sign of a pin on a vast ocean. The timing of the 5.8 mini globe is to catch this part of the Pacific Ocean in the Northern Hemisphere spring. The Vendi Globe and Global Solo Challenge races leave earlier in the year for a different reason. They want to hit the Southern Ocean in the summer, which is December, January, and February at the very latest. The Vendi Globe and Solo Global solo challenge races are done on completely different boats and are provisioned and prepared totally different than the 580s. They are just two different types of races, but the sailors from each are just as courageous and skilled between the two. Meanwhile, back on the Atlantic on Columbus's route to the Caribbean, let's take a look at what the prevailing winds look like. This screen grab was taken just a couple of days into the 580 transat. In the upper right, you'll see the Canary Islands off the coast of Africa where the magnification is. This is where this particular leg of the 5.8 or 580 transatlantic transat started. You'll see a nice flow of wind from the northeast that then flows westward right into the windward islands of the Caribbean. The windward islands of the Caribbean get their name from the fact that they are on the windward side of the Caribbean, into the wind. Here's the arrow where Antigua, the first stop and end of the transat is. Also notice that there's a big storm in the North Atlantic that has a few, huge influence on the wind, even down to the latitude of the Caribbean. My guess is that there are winds of 40 knots or more in this storm. Notice that the storm swirls counterclockwise, which is the direction that the swirl goes for storms in the northern hemisphere. To the lower right, you will see an area where the prevailing winds seem to flow right into each other. This is called, and there's more than one, a convergence zone. You'll see that there's a lack of prevailing wind in that area. Not a good place to get stuck on a sailing boat. I have another video where I talk about convergence zones that you'll see in the comments below. Another place that I'll point out to your attention is the calm area that's east of the windward islands of the Caribbean. In Columbus's log, it indicates that there was a near mutiny aboard his ship on his first voyage at about 60 days out from Spain. That's a long time en route, even for a slow 15th century ship. The agreement with the crew to call off the mutiny is that they would turn back if they did not see land within three days. Of course, we know the end of this story, but it is curious if the mutiny occurred in this calm area, which is a common calm area of, of the North Atlantic. Now, in another way, Columbus was really lucky as well. He arrived on his first voyage in Hispanola on October 12th. For those of you who live in Florida or the southern east coast of the U.S., yep, you got that right. Columbus made landfall in the Bahamas at the height of the hurricane season. 
Here is a depiction of the winds at the forming of Hurricane Milton in September of 2024. Notice that the hurricanes form in this prevailing wind area from the hip of Africa towards the Caribbean. The hurricane season in this area begins in June and ends in November. Again, another reason why the 5.8 class is crossing the Atlantic in, the, in this area in January or February. If you were at the harbor of Lanzarote in the Canary Islands when the Mini 5.8s departed in 2025, you will also have seen other numerous other boats and even races that were also starting for the Caribbean right at about this time. So it's sort of cl like climbing Mount Everest. The best and really only practical time is within a very short uh, window for the entire year. Okay, brain stuff full yet? Let's wrap up today with what is my main reason for making these videos. The 5.8 meter class and its transoceanic and transcircumnavigation races are really unique and unprecedented developments. One of the ways that it is truly unique is that it is financially possible for us, the unsponsored and the non-celebrities, to compete in. While a Vendee Globe boat is probably pushing at least one million dollars apiece, I bet a good 5.8, and you can look at them online, can be bought or built for about 25k. Which begs the question, is this your destiny too? For really the first time in history, in my opinion, this is realistically possible. And here are some of the links that can concretely get you pointed in the right direction. I also have another video, the link is in the comments, that talks about how to use these sources and links and get those skills on the fast track and be on a boat within 60 days. Are you ready? In my next video, I'll talk about the four things you absolutely must get rid of before you sail offshore. Get rid of, I say? Yep. And a hint is that it comes from one of my other trades, that of being a pilot. So if you haven't clicked subscribe and the notification bell, do that now, and you'll get that video hot off the press. And it's everything with the modern world of YouTube for free. I'll go into debriefs and case studies. You'll see why getting rid of these things are critical. But until then, look at these links. Go to the Mini Globe Race website and follow there too. Get on a boat or your boat and let's experience the 5.8 class Mini Globe together. New videos coming soon.